All right. So obviously it's Christmas Day today, and um, we're gonna. I'm gonna do a Christmas sermon on the birth of our Savior Jesus Christ, and we started off here in Isaiah chapter nine. Probably uh, my one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible is verse number 6 that we just read there. For unto us a child is born. That's why we preach around this morning. The child that was born, that the, reason, the whole reason why we're celebrating Christmas to begin with. You know, the world's going to try to tell you it's all about Santa Claus and the reindeer and Frosty the Snowman and everything else, you know, and buying gifts and buy, 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 and you have to give everyone gifts and get focused on everything else but on Jesus Christ our Savior. And, and there really are a lot of distractions out there from what the whole holiday is really supposed to be about. And it's easy to get caught up even in just visiting with people. And look, we visit with family. We visited with family yesterday. And, and normally we would be today, but we, you know, we're, we're bound here because church is a priority. And we're going to church no matter what. So we're not going to travel and go out because, uh, you know, to visit family when we're going to be here in order to. And not just because I'm the pastor. That's the way it would be no matter where we're at. You know, recognizing and honoring Jesus Christ is, is the most important thing. We don't, we don't change those things. But this, this world, it's easy to get distracted on, on all the other stuff, on the, the covetousness of, of, of wanting all these things. And, you know, even as a kid, I know growing up, all I got focused on about Christmas was the presents. And that's all I thought about. That's all I cared about. And it's a shame. I'm, I'm sad to admit that. And, but, you know, I, I can understand as a, as a child... You know, there's a, there's a lot of lack of, of, of maturity and wisdom, and, and it's easy to get distracted with those things. But especially as adults, you know, we ought to be focused on what is truly important. What is this day about? I mean, if you, you know, some people don't celebrate this holiday. That's fine. I have no problem with that. But if you choose to celebrate this holiday as the birth of Jesus Christ, let's celebrate it for that. Let's not get caught up in, in all the nonsense that this world's putting out there and, and just take the time, set aside Time for Jesus Christ, for God to just honor him and respect him and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for coming in this world. Thank you for saving my soul. And look, at I love this verse, verse number six, of who Jesus Christ really is. If you know people, if you ever come into contact with people who are either Mormon or Jehovah's Witness, who do not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ was literally God in the flesh, I love bringing them to this verse because this, to me this is undeniable and, and every time I brought this up to people who just don't want to hear what the Bible has to say and just want to stick to their own you know, religion and what they've been taught, they have no, no good answer at all for this verse because it's so clear. Look at verse number, number six. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Nobody would deny that this is talking about Jesus Christ. Everybody accepts that that I've ever run into with this verse. And look what it says. It says, And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Jesus Christ is wonderful, full of wonder and amazement, the miracles that he's done, and, and, and the wonderful mercy that is wonderful. Counselor. Jesus Christ is the one that we go to to receive counsel, to get advice, to get direction in our life. He is the counselor. I mean, he is such a counselor that his name is Counselor. Wonderful Counselor. The Mighty God. That's a real sticker right there for people who don't want to believe that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, is God as part of the Godhead, the triune God, the three in one. Jesus Christ, the mighty God. And see, and what they'll try to say is, well, it doesn't say the almighty God. Well, at what, to which I answer, how many gods do you believe in? Because the Bible says that there's one God, that there's one Lord. And we believe that there's one God. We believe that there's a Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. It's, it's called the Godhead. But the mighty God, and then, this, and, then, and then to top that off, if that's not enough, the everlasting Father. Jesus Christ, the Son, is the everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. Wonderful names. One of those names is wonderful. Great names for Jesus Christ. And who it is that we are celebrating today. I mean, you think, but you see, you see the manger scenes and you see the pictures, which obviously we're celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ, but we have a tendency also, you know, the, the, it's such an awesome event to think that the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, was actually born as a child, as an infant, as, as uh, um, 
vulnerable, susceptible, a human being, but God incarnate in the flesh. The, the humanity of Jesus Christ is incredible to, to try to wrap our minds around. We're in Isaiah 9. Just flip back to chapter 7 real quick. The perfect son was born. And I, the first point I want to make here is that Jesus Christ, as God in the flesh, was perfect. He was without sin. He had no errors, no problems, no disobedience, no rebellion. Look at verse 14. There's the prophecy of Jesus Christ being born. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. He was raised a certain way to know right from wrong. And, and, and he, as he grew as a child, he grew in wisdom and in stature. The Bible says that he, didn't, he wasn't born, even though he was God in the flesh, he wasn't born having all knowledge of everything. He grew and, and understood more as he grew old. That's what it says in stature means like your height. So like as he's physically growing as, as a human being, he's also growing in wisdom. So when God took on the form of a man by being born of a virgin, he took on limitations associated with being a man. And again, try to wrap your mind around that, how God, who, who knows everything and, and is perfect and created everything, can limit himself in such a way to become a man. But that's exactly what happened through Jesus Christ. He grew in wisdom and in stature. He was, you know, he was given butter and honey to eat that he may know to refuse the evil and to choose the good. And notice the way that butter and honey are both good things in the Bible. So I don't care what the, the doctors and anyone else is saying these days about, oh, butter's bad for you, whatever. Look, if the Bible says it's good for you, I believe it's good for you. If that's part of the diet of, of the Levites, it's part of the diet in, in, in all throughout the Bible. You know, a land that flows with milk and honey, and of course you get butter from milk. It's, these are good things. These are, these are not bad. God's not telling you to consume bad things. Jesus Christ wasn't given bad things to eat in order to, you know, to when it says that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the, the point I'm making here is that the way that you know how to choose the good is by receiving the good and knowing the good and knowing the good as much as possible. Once you know the good, you'll, you'll know what's evil because it's the, it's the exact opposite. Uh, the, the best way I could probably explain this is, you know, if you wanted to know, if you wanted to be really good at spotting counterfeit bills, counterfeit money, right? People want to print up money on their own. You don't spend all of your time studying all the fake dollars. You spend your time studying the real one. And once you really know what, it, what that one, you know, all the intricacies, all the little details, everything about that one, when you're introduced with something that's false, something that's counterfeit, you can spot it because you know the right so well. That's how we ought to be dealing with our life in general when it comes to knowing what's right and wrong you know, we don't need to be studying all of the false religions of the world. We don't need, in order to talk to a Mormon, a Jehovah's Witness, or all these other people you know, I mentioned earlier, you know, or a Muslim, we don't need to just study their books, study all of everything about them in order to know everything about their religion. We just need to know the truth really, 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 really well. When we know that, that everything about this, we can answer all of the other questions and all of the other problems when you know the truth and you know the Word of God very well. That's the way that we ought to um, be able to know to choose, refuse the evil and choose the good and also be instructed by knowing the right uh, extremely well. Turn if you would to Matthew one twenty one. We'll see this in um, the New Testament. Of course, from Isaiah 7, the prophecy... Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Well, in Matthew 1, we see the fulfillment of that prophecy. Verse number 21, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord, spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So his very name alone, Emmanuel, 
means God with us. God incarnate, which is who he was. God in the flesh. One more point, just while we're on these two verses, Isaiah 7, 14, Matthew 1, 23, if you want to make a note of this in your Bible, the reason why we believe that life begins at conception and we do not believe in any form of abortions, any type of killing a life once it's been conceived, we don't believe in that at all because it is life. You know, the, the, this world's going to try to tell you it's a blastocyst, it's a fetus, and, and use all these other terms to dehumanize what a real, actual life is. The reason why, the biblical reason why we can say that life begins at conception is found right here in Isaiah 7, 14 and Matthew 1, 23. The Old Testament verse, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, is translated, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son. So the words that were changed there were conceive, a virgin shall conceive, and a virgin shall be with child. So the conception means with child. There's a child in there. It still has a lot of development and growing to do. But guess what? We're still growing, even outside of the womb. Children grow. I have a, we have a baby growing in the womb right now. We've got a 15-month-old, and he's going to continue to grow. Right? And that the, the, from the moment that our child was conceived in the womb, it starts to grow. And it changes a little bit, but it's still a child. From that conception, it's a child. And we don't, we're, not, we're not child murderers. We don't kill children. And this is a biblical reason, that the biblical definition, not even a reason, a definition that life, a, a, a conception, when the seed and the, and the egg conceive, you have a child there. Turn if you would to Luke chapter 2. Of course, we've got the famous birth story, which is very common. We read this every single year with our children uh, just as a, a family tradition before we open up any gifts. Because we, we, we enjoy giving gifts. There's no problem with gift giving when you celebrate a great day, you know, a, a day that, that makes you happy, a day we celebrate. We're celebrating Jesus Christ. Hey, giving gifts is wonderful. It's a good way to celebrate, you know, eating a nice meal, fellowshipping, all great ways to, to, to spend a time of, of a holiday or a holy day where we are um, honoring, especially when we're honoring our Lord. But what we do every year is before we go and open up the presents is I sit the kids down and we read Luke chapter 2. We read the whole chapter and explain what are we doing this for? Why are we giving gifts? What do we care about the most? What, you know, what happened here? We read Jesus Christ's birth and we just explain it every single year just to make sure I, I as a parent, for one, don't ever want our kids to misunderstand the meaning of Christmas. So from the moment they're one all the way up until they get out of my house and, we, and, and, and have nothing to do with us anymore, whatever, they're going to hear Luke chapter 2 at least every single year on Christmas Day. And um, like I said, that's our family tradition. But not only is it good for the children, it's good for the parents. It's good for us. We get stressed out. There's all these plans and we're doing everything else. We need to be able to take a time to set aside and say, no, we're going to recognize what it is that we've got all worked up about anyways and, and spent all this money for and did all, you know, and, and made all these plans and preparations for. It's for Jesus Christ. We're going to look here. Uh, we're not going to read the whole thing just for sake of time, but we're going to start reading here in verse number seven. Bob reads, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, watch, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And just a quick note here, in case you know, when the Bible talks about glory, it's a, it's a shining. It's a brightness. That's what glory is. So there's a glory of the sun and a glory of the moon when they give their light, when they shine. And the Bible says right here, so these shepherds are out in the field. The angel of the Lord came upon them. There's an angel came unto them. And the glory of the Lord has shone round about them. And they were so afraid. So this great shining light came around them from, you know, basically from the angels, the glory of the Lord. And, um, of course, they were afraid because they're like, what is this? Is it a UFO? What's going on here? And uh, verse number 10 says, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. 
Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And that's what we just sang that song. You know, I heard the bells on Christmas Day, and it, and it has this, this verse in there, you know, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. That's where it comes from right here. Jesus Christ came. It says here, he's a savior. He came to save the world. Of course, the, the whole world only, would only get saved if they put their faith in Jesus Christ. But he came as a little baby. He was wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And at that time, it says, not only was the angel there, then a whole multitude of the heavenly hosts. So heavenly beings were then surrounded by, you know, the, were surrounding this angel. And these shepherds watched this whole event happen. I can't imagine what that must have been like to be one of those shepherds, to, see, to witness this event. And just singing, or saying, glory to God in the highest, just praising God. Glory to God in the highest, on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Why goodwill? Because Jesus Christ came. That is some goodwill. goodwill. Now, I want to shift gears a little bit, because besides honoring and reverencing Jesus on this day, which is extremely important. That's why we started off just, just bringing up his names and, and how important he is and being extremely thankful that he loved us enough to take the form of a man, to endure the shame of the cross and to die for us and to offer salvation as a free gift. You know, that's one, and, and as a side note, and again, I'm going to bring this up, one of the wicked things about using Santa Claus on Christmas time is it completely destroys the concept of a free gift. And the fact that you are told as a child, Santa knows who's good and who's bad. And if you're not good, he's not going to bring you anything. Now, is that the way that salvation works? If you're not good, God's not going to give you salvation. Absolutely not. Is that even a free gift? If you have to act a certain way and be good, is that even really a gift? No, you're earning it through your good works. This concept of using Santa Claus is to keep kids behaving well. You're holding something over their head. One of the main, re one of the reasons why we don't do that. First of all, I don't like to lie to my children. I want to tell them the truth. When I tell them that there is something that they can't see that's going to do good for them, I don't want them to find out later that what I'm telling them is a lie. So when I tell them there's a, a man called Jesus Christ, that he's the Savior of the world that they can't see, but they have to believe in him, I don't want them growing up later and being like, oh, well, they told me that Santa Claus was real. They told me that he flew on a sled and a sleigh and had all these reindeer and lived at the North Pole and he brought all these gifts and did these good things for me and that I had to behave myself because he's watching me. And that just all turned out to be a lie. So I wonder what else is a lie. I wonder what else isn't true. No, I want my children to have trust in their parents that they're going to tell them the truth. And I also want them to know where their gifts are coming from. It's not from some fat man in the North Pole. <laughs> your parents love you, and when you get gifts, they're from us. They're from your family. They're from people that care about you. And when we want to give you a gift, we want to give you a gift. That it, you know, it's not, it has nothing necessary to do with whether you're good or bad. It's because we love you that we want to give you gifts. And it's the same reason why God wants you to have the gift of salvation. It's why he wants you to be saved, because he loves you. And he paid for the gift. He did everything for the gift. He just wants you to accept it, just to receive that free gift. That is how we ought to be demonstrating the spirit of Christmas and what it's all about. But it's been perverted. It's been twisted. It's been warped these days. And we should have nothing to do with it. Reject it. But the second application I want to make on this birth story and life of Jesus Christ is with our second birth. There's a lot of, of, of wisdom we could learn when we look at the birth of Jesus and his life with any other person who gets saved. Because when you get saved, you're born again. The Bible says, but as many as received him, them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Jesus Christ said in John chapter 3, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
We must be born again in order to go to heaven. We need a new birth. And that birth actually follows, when we are born again, that birth follows very similarly to Jesus Christ's birth. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm going to read this for you. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 1, please. 1 Peter chapter 1, all the way near the end of the Bible. Jesus Christ came in this world for many reasons. The chief of those is to save us, but he was also came to provide us an example of how we ought to live our lives. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. The Bible explains to us Jesus Christ, he came in the flesh, and he's not this high priest that says that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Jesus knows all too well what we're going through. He knows our infirmities. He knows what we are lacking. He knows what it's like to, to go through this life and to experience pain. He knows what it's like to feel hunger. He knows what it's like to experience grief and sadness and sorrow. He knows what it's like to go through all these things. He knows what it's like to be hated. He knows what it's like to be picked on. He knows what it's like to have all the bad things happen to you in this lifetime. He went through it all. So nobody today can say, well, he doesn't really know. Besides him knowing everything, he experienced and went through it. We don't have this high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He went through it all. He was in all points tempted like we are. Tempted means he's tested. We're tested all the time in making the right choice, doing what's right versus doing what's wrong. Jesus Christ did all of that. He, he, he had all of the opportunities in front of him to sin. The devil came to him specifically and tried to get him to sin. It was in his face and offered him the whole world and offered him all this stuff and offered him all the riches and offered him all the glory and offered him all these things to get him to sin. And he wouldn't do it. Jesus Christ was without sin. Praise God for that. We needed a perfect Savior to save us. And he was. He came to be an example. But when Jesus was born, he was God in the flesh. He was perfect. He was that perfect being. We are not perfect. We have this sinful flesh. We are driven to do things that is not right, that is not good, that is sinful. Which is exactly why we need to be born again. We need that birth. We need that new birth. You're in 1 Peter chapter 1 because... Even though we are not perfect, even though we have this flesh, there's a perfect spirit that is born within us at our second birth. When Jesus Christ was born, he was perfect, he was sinless. When we are born again, that second birth is a spiritual birth. That spirit is without sin and is perfect. This is a direct result of being born of the incorruptible seed, which is Christ in us. Look at uh, verse number 3 of 1 Peter chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Man, there's so much crammed into these three verses that we just read here. According to God's mercy, He's given us our second birth. He's begotten us again. That's what it means to have a second birth. And a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Why is it a lively hope? Because Jesus Christ is alive. He came back from the dead. He came back from the grave. Alive. To an inheritance incorruptible. We have an, Once you're born again, you're born into a family. God is your father. And the same way that in this lifetime when your parents pass away, oftentimes you will receive some form of an inheritance. Whatever it is that they have left behind, whatever physical goods they have in this world, when they pass away, will be passed down to their children in most cases. That's an inheritance. It's what you receive. But that inheritance goes away. 
It's just money, it's just things, it's just houses, it's just material possessions that end up breaking and being destroyed and getting stolen and being lost or whatever. But the inheritance that God gives us is much, much better. We have, it's, it's incorruptible. You cannot corrupt it, you cannot defile it, undefiled. It fades not away. It doesn't go anywhere. And it's reserved in heaven for you. God's holding that inheritance in heaven for you. And it says that we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Jump down to verse number 18 in there in 1 Peter chapter 1. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. Silver and gold, the Bible's saying right there, those are corruptible. Those go away. Those could, can be changed. Those could be stolen. Those can be destroyed. We are not redeemed with corruptible things. God didn't buy us with silver and gold. He didn't redeem us with that. And that wasn't money. From your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. It's Christ's blood that paid for us, not silver and gold. Silver and gold are cheap in comparison to the blood of the Savior that he shed for us on that cross. Verse 20, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. This shows us that our second birth, being born again, it's not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. The word of God is incorruptible, by the way. And this is why we use a King James Bible. This is the incorruptible word of God that we're holding in our hands this morning. There are many perversions, there are many corrupted words of God out there, but we are born again by the incorruptible Word of God. That is where our birth comes from. Turn, if you would, to 1 John chapter 3. You're in 1 Peter, just a, a, a page or two forward from 1 Peter. You have 1 and 2 Peter, you have 1, 2, and 3 John. So you're going to go to 1 John chapter number 3. First John chapter 3, look at verse number 9. I'm relating the birth of Christ with the second birth that we receive at salvation. First John chapter 3, verse number 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. When we're born again, it's our spirit that has that new birth, that spirit is born of the incorruptible Word of God. It's born from God. It, it, it's that, that is the seed, right? We have a physical seed and egg that come together for conception. Well, the seed that is used for our second birth is the Word of God, the incorruptible Word of God. No spot, no blemish, no sin, complete perfection is used in our second birth. And in that second birth, because of that second birth, that which is born, that spirit which is born, doesn't commit sin. That spirit is perfect. Why? For his seed remaineth in him. That seed, that perfect, incorruptible word of God is still there. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. You say, wait a minute, I'm born again, but I still sin. And that's true. Your spirit doesn't, though. It's your flesh that drives you to sin. The Apostle Paul said, I'll just read this for you in Romans 7, verse 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. And, and it might sound like a tongue twister, but all he's saying is that the things that I want to do, I don't end up doing those. And the things that I don't want to do, the things that I hate, those are the things I end up doing. Why? Why is it like that? Why is it that in my spirit, I really want to do some good things? I really want to follow God, but then when it comes down to doing it, I don't end up doing it. 
He explains this, verse 16. He says, if then I do that which I would not, and would just means he doesn't want to do it. If I do the things I don't want to do, I consent unto the law that it is good. So the, the law is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. It's the sin. It's the sinful flesh that drives us. That's why we have this daily battle and we have to fight the flesh. When you have the spirit is driving you to do good, the flesh drives you to do that which is evil. But that second birth, that spiritual birth is perfect, is without sin. Just as Jesus Christ was without sin when he was born. Being born of God. We need to be dying to self daily. We need to be picking up our cross daily and walking in the spirit daily and not in our flesh. One more application on the birth of Christ um, from Luke 2, 7. We already read this. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. One more application on the birth of Christ. We read this. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Joseph and Mary were traveling and they were going to pay their taxes. And as they were on their way, it came time for Mary to give birth unto Jesus Christ. And the reason why he was born and laid in a manger, just you know, outside, maybe in some shelter um, with, with the animals around in, 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 in an area that was not uh, very nice for them to be staying in is because there was no room in the inn. And the inn is like a hotel, right? So there's just no room. There's no vacancy. There's every, it's all full. They're at capacity. Now, What I want to point out is that from the very birth of Christ, from day number one, there were difficulties. There's challenges, right? I mean, not even able to be giving birth. I mean, these days, a lot of people give birth in hospitals and they have all the stuff around, you know, and, and some of us, you know, we do home births, but we have everything prepped. We have everything ready to go. There's a lot of comfort. There's, there's, there's everything that, you know, planned out and got together there you could possibly want to make the best birth possible and have everything at your disposal, right? Well, imagine then giving birth just in a hotel room where you don't have everything you want necessarily. You're traveling and it's like, oh, the baby's coming. What are we going to do? Uh, let's look around. Maybe we can find a hotel where we can stay for the night. There's no hotel. There's nothing available. So what are we going to do? Well, we got to find somewhere to go. Let's go in this barn over here. Let's go in the shelter over here and give birth there. I mean, talk about not having anything all prepared and ready to go. This was the birth of Jesus Christ. This is what happened. This is the challenge and difficulty from day number one that Jesus received coming into this world. He didn't have everything going for him. He wasn't born with some silver spoon in his mouth. His parents weren't rich. They didn't have a whole bunch of money. He wasn't even born in an inn, but in a very meager surrounding and situation. While he was yet an infant. So there's, there's the first challenge right at birth. Not having anywhere to stay, not having anywhere to be, and coming into this world with nothing. While he was yet an infant, the attacks and the hatred started already against Jesus Christ. Look at Matthew chapter 2, verse number 13. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt. And be there, and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, because earlier the wise men came into town because they saw the star and, they, and they, were, they were looking for the prophets. They were looking for the Savior. They were looking for Jesus Christ. And so they came into town trying to find him. They're like, well, where is he? And Herod heard that they had come in and had spoken with them. He said, hey, when you find him, let me know because I want to go worship him too. Well, they found him, but then God revealed unto them, you know, don't go and tell Herod where he's at. Because he doesn't want to go worship him. So then they just left another way and they never went and told Herod about it. So when Herod, he's waiting, he's waiting, he's waiting, right? These wise men never come back and tell him where Jesus is. So now he realizes here in verse 16, and Herod saw that he was mocked of the wise men because they didn't do what he told them to do. 
He was exceeding wroth. He was ex really angry. And sent forth and slew. That means he killed all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. So he figured out, well, he would have been born right around this time because he got that much information out of the wise men. So I'm going to kill everybody from two years old and under just to make sure that I wipe them out. How wicked and how evil is that? Killing innocent, killing children two years old and under. Jesus was on the lamb in another country. He had to go flee into Egypt. His parents had to bring him there. He's still an infant. He couldn't do anything for himself. The attack started. Born in a place, not at home. Born out on the road. Going to a foreign country. Again, not having anything there. They're fleeing for their lives. For the life of Jesus Christ. Right from the very beginning, that life was sought out to be destroyed. And as a new birth, when a person is born again into this world, there is a lot of opposition. There are a lot of obstacles. There is a lot of hatred. There is a lot that, that you'll be facing persecution as a Christian, as that new life. We need to be aware of this. We look at what happened with Jesus Christ. We can't expect anything different for ourselves. There are evil forces at work. When, especially, when a person brand new, they put their faith in Jesus Christ, they're born again. You know what? The devil has nothing to do to stop that person from going to heaven. They're sealed, man. They got eternal life. They're saved forever. He can't make that person go to hell, but you know what he could do? He could still try to stomp them out. He could still try to get them not to serve God. He could scare them. He could do whatever he can to, to, to get them to stop. And the attacks will come. You're most vulnerable as a new believer, as a new believer. As a believer, you're vulnerable at the newest point. You're like an infant. When a person first puts their faith in Christ, they're like an infant in Christ. They don't know anything. They're not grounded and rooted down and settled and established yet in their faith because it's new. There's a lot they have to learn. There's a lot they need to understand about God's Word and about the Bible. It's a lot easier to be shaken and, and, and have your faith challenged and have people lie to you and attack you and try to get you to stop going to church and stop believing and give up all this nonsense because they're, they're still just an infant. It's a lot easier to deceive a child. It's a lot easier to hurt a child. There's a lot less defenses that they have. It's a lot harder when someone has spiritually matured and they've grown up and they know they're about, it's going to be a lot harder to shake that person. But from a young age, we saw it happen to Jesus. That's why it's important to have people looking out for you. That's why it's important to get involved and get plugged into a good church. You can help, you can have some more people, you know, looking out for you and there to help uh, guide you and, and give you direction as a new believer. But it's also important for us then that when we go out and, and help to bring forth those new births to be involved in their lives and not just leave them. Not just leave them off to, you know, on the side of the road, so to speak, to just say whatever happens, happens. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah 53. We're going to see some prophecy here on Jesus Christ. We're going to see more about the life of Jesus Christ and what his life entailed, what he went through, the things that, hey, if he went through these things and he's our example and we're supposed to be following him and we have this new birth, we have this new spirit that's born in us, the new spirit is perfect, it's born of incorruptible seed, just as Jesus Christ was. We have this spirit. Let's look at the life of Christ. Let's see some insight into who Jesus is and what he went through. Look at verse number one of Isaiah 53. Bible reads, Who hath believed our report, and unto whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a, as a root out of dry ground. A root out of dry ground. First, I mean, just from the very beginning, does that sound very good? I mean, if you have a garden and you're trying to grow something, you need to water it. You need to water it consistently. I mean, you need to have a nice, fertile, wet ground in order to get a nice plant to grow up. Well, Jesus was like a root out of a dry ground. What does it mean? He didn't have anything. He didn't have the great conditions. He didn't have the nice, fertile soil to be, to be grown up from. 
He's as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So what else did he have going against him? Jesus Christ, he didn't have the good looks. He wasn't the handsome man that everybody looked to and desired and say, oh, wow, look at this guy. He's so great looking. None of that. He was, he was not, not anything to look at. He might have looked a little bit nerdy. He might have looked a little, you know, someone that people might want to pick on more than anything else. He had no comeliness. Verse number three. He is despised, that means hated, and rejected of men. He was a reject. People didn't want to be around him. They didn't like him. Overall, right? Obviously, he had his disciples. He had people that follow and listen to him because they realized who he was. But just naturally, as a person, people had nothing to do with him. He was rejected despised. People hated him. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He knew sorrow and sadness all too well. It's important to point that out because we may go through plenty of times in this life where we have a lot of grief and a lot of sorrow. We get depressed and we think nobody understands us and, and we could get bitter against the world, against everything else in our life. But we need to understand, you know what? Jesus Christ was well acquainted with grief. He knows what it's like to be sorrow to be full of sorrow and to be sad and have this depression, so to speak. He knows what it's like. He's been through it himself. He's been rejected. He's been hated. Plenty of good reasons to be sad and to be grieved. He knows all about it all too well. And look at this. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. We just hid from him. No one wanted to go help him out. No one wanted to, to do anything for him. How does that make you feel? You're already depressed. You're already hated. And then no one wants to be around you. We hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. So in the midst of all this, he did this in order to take our grief, to take our sorrow on himself while he was being hated and not esteemed. Talk about selfless. How much do you feel like doing something for someone else when they're not helping you and they're mocking you and ridiculing you when you're going through hard times? But that's what Jesus did. He went through it for us even after nobody was, was esteeming him and noting was treating him well. He still went through it in order to carry even more burden and grief upon himself. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. That's how people looked at him. Oh, well, God's punishing him. And you know what he was? But it wasn't for anything that he had done. Not at all. Verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone out to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. You know what that means? While he's being oppressed and afflicted, he didn't complain about it. He didn't open up his mouth. He allowed it to happen. He went through it. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. He was, when Jesus Christ was crucified, he was hung up on a cross with thieves on either side of him, just with your, your, your criminals and, and people who had caused a lot of problems and just, just done, you know, whatever horrible things worthy back then to be put to death. Jesus was no criminal, but he was, he was put up there just like any other criminal being put to death. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Verse number 10. He hath put him to grief. 
When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Christ is our example. We have that new birth. We see what he went through. We see the things that he did. I mean, we should be humbled for, for him doing all this for us, out of the love for us. But he is the example. He did not live an easy life by any stretch of the imagination. He was homeless. When he, when he did his ministry, he wandered about and, and he preached to people and cared about people. He healed people. He did everything for everybody else and did not care at all about himself. And after doing all the work and healing and everything else he did, you know what he'd do? He'd spend hours praying. He'd pray half the night. When you're born again, if you want to follow Christ, because it's a common prayer here, a lot of people, oh, I'm following Christ. Are you, are you really? How comfortable is your life? How comfortable is everything in your life? If you live a very comfortable life, you're not following Christ. I hate to break it to you, but you're not. The life of following Christ is not a comfortable one. If you want to try to live for him, don't expect it to be all roses and happy. There is grief, there's sorrow, but look, it's rewarding and God will reward you more and more than any of that. I mean, he's, he will bless you for it. And I'm not saying it's, it's a horrible life. There is joy to be found and we ought to be joyful. But the joy is in our hope. It's in the future. And it's in the joy of helping others. The Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. And oh, that is a true statement. As I've grown and matured physically and spiritually, I, I, I've come to realize how true that is. As I mentioned, as a child at Christmas time, I loved getting those gifts. Man, it was all about me. I was thinking, oh, this is great. I've got this toy and this toy and this is so much fun and this is awesome. I love giving people gifts now. That's, I don't even, I don't, want, I don't think about getting gifts. I don't care about getting gifts, what I care about. And it's nice if you know, anyone wants to give gifts, great, that's fine. You know, and, 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 you know, there's, it's nice to accept and receive, but I never even think about that anymore. It's, what I think about is the, is the giving. I love looking at the, the looks on anybody's, for my children especially, but anyone else. When we're able to give someone a gift, there's, it is truly amazing to be able to do that. And that is a lot of wisdom. And then, you know what? That's what Jesus had for us. And that brings a lot of joy. You look at this and say, well, man, Pastor Burson, you know, I I'm, not, I'm not feeling very inclined to want to follow Jesus after everything you just preached about this morning. But I'll tell you what, even with all the, I'm, I'm telling you this to just, to warn you, to let you know, hey, this is what life's going to bring to you. We need to be ready for it. But at the same time, there is a lot of joy that you can still receive by living the Christian life. And there's, there's, you have grief, you have joy. The joy isn't going to become just because you're super comfortable and just everything's going great and you got your nice home and, and, and you're, you know, there is, a, there is a joy that's associated with that, but that's a physical joy. That's a carnal joy. That's something that you receive just being here in this lifetime. That's not a spiritual joy. And we need, we need to make, if you want to follow Christ and you want to understand your second birth, we look at the birth and the life of Christ. We're not better than Jesus. The world hated him and it's going to hate you too. However, Jesus had love for the world and gave himself for it. And that should also dictate who we are. That's who he was and what he did. We should have that love for the world too, for the, you know, not the world in, in large of the things the world does, but for the people of the world, right? For, for other people, for the lost. We should love them enough to share the, uh, the good news. Let's celebrate the birth of the Savior. And our second birth and help bring other people to experience that birth also. 
We're going to close with 1 John chapter 4. You can turn it if you'd like, 1 John chapter 4. I'm just going to close with this one verse. I think this is the best way to celebrate the birth of our Savior and our own second birth. It's funny, we just heard this yesterday. The subjects that people don't want to talk about, right? Well, I don't talk about politics and religion. I don't talk about those things. Especially not on Christmas. I mean, we got the whole family together. What, do you think we're going to talk about religion? I think you should. I think you should talk about Jesus. What are you getting together for? What are you celebrating? Let's share that good news. 1 John chapter 4, verse number 9, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. It's not mean, it's not hateful, it's not, it's not taboo or wrong to, to talk about Jesus at Christmas. Or any time for that matter. God loved us enough to send His only begotten Son to die for us. We ought to love others. We ought to look at that love, look at the love that God had for us and, and telling us about His Son, giving us this information, and let's pass that love along. And let other people know that there is a Savior. And this is what we're celebrating today. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your only begotten Son. Lord, we thank you for the love that you have for us, that you made this wonderful plan to save our souls. We thank you for loving us even though we're sinners, even though we've done so many things that are despicable in our own lives. God, we thank you for the mercy and the long-suffering that you have. We thank you for the second birth, for that new incorruptible birth that we, that, we had, that we receive at salvation, that you've given us this new spirit, dear Lord. Help us all to die to the, to the flesh and to live in our spirit daily, dear God. And, and Lord, whoever we come into contact today, Lord, help us not to be negligent. Help us to love these people enough to tell them about Jesus. Those ones that we know that aren't saved, God, help us to just share the love you had for the world with them by, uh, by giving them the gospel of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.